and welcome to the Oddity Archive, the show that isn't afraid to jump right off the cliff right behind all the other retro content slash tech channels. Anyway, today's episode was supposed to happen a lot closer to when I covered the Sony mini disc. But it's taken me almost a couple of years to get my hands on not only a unit for this format, but one that works well enough to get the episode made. So I've actually really been looking forward to this one, in large part because I was totally oblivious to this format in its day. So yeah, it's going to be learning together. But anyway, today let's take a look at the competitor to the mini disc. The Philips Digital Compact Cassette, or DCC. Hello, my friends. I mean you. Yes, you. We are all interested in the future. For that is where you and I will spend the rest of our lives. The roots of the DCC can be traced back to Sony's DAT, or DAT, or Digital Audio Tape, format. While DAT managed to catch on to some degree in recording studios, it was a total non-starter on the consumer front, due to a high price tag and only a precious few pre-recorded releases. So few that they're all serious collector's items now. Anyway, the music industry hated the DAT format, because not only could it, consumer gear notwithstanding, perfectly reproduce a 16-bit 44.1 kHz CD, but theoretically do so from tape to tape with no degradation in sound. But all that's a story for another episode. Around this time, Sony opted to shift focus away from tape-based formats, hence the mini-disc, while Philips, in tandem with Matsushita Panasonic, decided to not only pick up where the DAT format left off, but also to update their trusty old compact cassette. Indeed, initially the DCC was named SDAT, Stationary Head Digital Audio Tape, as opposed to regular DAT, aka RDAT, or Rotary Head Digital Audio Tape. On paper, Philips and Matsushita came up with the best of all worlds. The quality of a CD or DAT, recording capability, and backward compatibility with regular cassettes. A prototype, presumably the 850 model, was unveiled at the CES Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas in early 1991. ability to play back all of your existing conventional analog cassettes on your new DCC machine. The DCC made its main public debut at the CES in Chicago on May 30th, 1992. Now, I can't find any concrete dates, but the first DCC decks appear to have been released sometime during the fourth quarter of 1992. Like the mini-disc, which debuted almost simultaneously, the early units were met with mixed reviews. Price was another major factor, with, by most accounts, pre-recorded DCC tapes selling for only slightly less, usually within one dollar, than their CD counterparts. The price of blanks were about on par with Type 4 metal cassettes, usually in the neighborhood of six to eight dollars a piece. As for the decks, for the first several months, only one model was available, namely the DCC-900, the most common model out there. The 900s most commonly sold for between seven and eight hundred dollars. The first portable deck, namely the DCC-130, didn't drop until the summer of 1993. was notoriously tight-lipped about sales figures, but dupe houses, record, and electronic stores were less so. 
let's just say if 1993 was supposed to be the banner year for the DCC, it wasn't much of one, with evidently in the US fewer than 100,000 tapes made, let alone sold. By the end of 1994, that figure fell to, by one American account, only about 8,000 tapes sold. While the DCC managed to gain a little ground over in Europe, especially the Netherlands, where Philips is based, it was never enough to put a dent in CD or regular cassette sales. To make matters worse, while Philips continued to release new models of players, including a portable unit that could double as a computer data storage device, the prices never seemed to come down enough for mass acceptance. Philips, unsurprisingly, pulled the plug on the format at the end of October of 1996. The final prices I can find for leftover stock, we're talking 1997, were still rather high, with the final portable and component units suggested prices being $449 and $549, respectively. According to the old DCC FAQ webpage, DCC tape was actually cut down VHS tape stock, which is close enough to type 2 chrome audio tape stock that some people have attempted drilling holes into the sides of regular type 2 cassettes to use in lieu of proper DCC tapes. The format ran on the Precision Adaptive Subband Coding, or PASC, compression format, which was an offshoot of the MPEG-1 format, which was also used on VCDs and the original Green Book Philips CDI movie discs. The compression amounts to about one quarter the bitrate of a CD. There were nine tracks of available data on the tape eight tracks of audio and error correction data, and one track containing track markers, song titles, and potentially lyrics. The playhead on the machines was also a nine-track head, which could and did double as playback for standard cassettes. Like DAT and Minidisc, the DCC uses the SCMS copy protection scheme, which allows for a copy of a tape, but not a copy of a copy. Ultimately, the DCC was capable of up to an 18-bit 44.1 kHz sampling rate. As far as I know, no pre-recorded releases ever had anything above 16-bit 44.1 kHz, i.e. the CD standard. For all its successes, the DCC, both tape and deck, have several drawbacks. Chief among them was some half-assed backward compatibility. You can record to DCC tapes, but you can't record to standard cassettes. Speaking of regular cassettes, DCC decks have a hard time reading Type 4 metal cassettes, so you're gonna want to avoid those. Also, the heads on a DCC deck are far more susceptible to oxide buildup than regular cassette decks. In other words, if you like to play regular tapes on your DCC deck, you're going to find yourself cleaning it a lot more often. Speaking of maintenance, the DCC is like a DAT deck, or a VCR for that matter, in that you do not want to demagnetize the heads. They'll lose the ability to read your tapes. And finally, if you're into portable listening, the DCC Walkman, I use the term generically, ran on <laughs> battery packs with enough of a charge for only two and a half hours of use. Of course, these battery packs are toast at this point in time. I've got six DCC tapes in my possession, three blanks, and three pre-records, 
and two of my blanks, both Panasonics, are indeed still sealed. And then there's this, uh, at the time, loose Bazif tape. And I don't know if this ever had the little sliding metal door on it, but it doesn't seem to affect anything. And uh, it was blank at the time. And uh, anyway, as far as the pre-records go, uh, one of these, and guess which one, was, unbeknownst to me, still inside the deck when I got it. So when I turned the deck on for the first time, I was greeted almost instantly with Vanessa Williams's Save the Best for Last, which was a blast from the past because I hadn't heard it in its hit version, at least since the 90s. Uh, it's been on laser karaoke, though. But uh, anyway, uh, this tape is still sealed, and I just thought it was poetic that my Mint Condition tape would be from a group called Mint Condition. But given that, unlike a regular cassette, a DCC, like any digital format, is generally all or nothing, I'm going to keep this still sealed tape just the way it is. Now, I've done transfers of everything, including my own recordings, and I think they're perfectly representative of the format. So anyway, let's take a cut here and we'll take a look at the deck. You'll have to pardon the noise. It's national idiot redneck neighbor and his family out blowing their leaves onto Benny Boy's yard day and just being obnoxious and all that. But uh, what you gonna do? Uh, legally, anyway. Yeah, I think he heard that. Anyway, as I mentioned at the top of the episode, I've been trying to get my hands on a working enough DCC deck to do an episode on it. And I kind of just got lucky with this one. So uh, back in late July, early August, I found this on Fleabay. And it was one of those deals where the seller misspelled the listing. And I wound up being the only bidder at $40 plus shipping. And the seller listed this as being in working order. And most encouragingly, had a picture of it playing a proper DCC tape, so I felt like I had a good shot at getting a working unit. Uh, however, not included was the remote. But I just had to have the remote, largely because I've never owned a cassette deck with one. And uh, of course the remote cost just about as much as the unit itself, because apparently these things are crazy rare now. And uh, anyway, as I mentioned, this was advertised as being in working order, and that only turned out to be half true. So this unit is beginning to suffer from the dreaded DCC failing capacitors, which first impede the playback of regular cassettes, which it already has, and ultimately impede the playback of DCC tapes. So I think I'm going to need to send this, or if I can get away with it, just the offending circuit board uh, to the DCC museum to get that taken care of. But as it stands, all I want to deal with in the short term are DCC tapes. And over the last few months, I've already done 90% of my tests and transfers and demos. So uh, don't be surprised if you see a follow up video on this at some unspecified future date. But anyway, let's take a look at the basic features of this guy. And I'm trying to keep the on time to a minimum here. But anyway, most famously, in an attempt at making this more like a CD player, you load your tape onto a tray, as opposed to the usual door method on uh, regular cassette decks. And on either side of the tray, you've got buttons to reset the counter, and uh, you know, like on a regular cassette deck, and to repeat a track, like on most CD players, and then you can switch between the text track on a DCC tape specifically and uh, or just the clock. Now, given the nature of the DCC uh, read, you can only insert the tape one way. The unit out of necessity has auto reverse, complete with one of those spinny playheads with the fixed azimuth. So the auto reverse can be accessed real nice and easy on the front panel at the bottom left here. And next to that, you've got all the usual stuff like play, rewind, fast forward, all that good stuff. 
Now, later models of these things included support for Dolby S encoded cassettes, but this one only does B and C. And on that note, the playback levels on regular cassettes, because of the whole capacitor thing, are so weak that when I turn the Dolby on, it renders the tape almost completely inaudible. Now, you can run this to an ESI bus kind of timer, so you can, uh, say, record a radio show while you're out. So we got a timer switch to do all that. And above that, you've got all the controls to mark a new track, erase a track, you know, all the manual control when you're doing recordings. Otherwise, for analog recordings, you've got manual record levels. And if you're recording from an optical or a SPDIF source, then it's all automatic. And of course, you can switch between inputs. I just keep mine on auto and it seems to work just fine. So anyway, let's take a cut here and we'll take a look at the back. On the back, we've got a regular line input for recording from any analog source. We've got two sets of analog outputs, and the one on the left is a variable output, which works so that you can control the volume with the, at the time, supplied remote control. Or you can go with the fixed output, so you can control the volume via your AV receiver, which is what I'd imagine most folks used, and actually it kind of seems redundant, because you could control the volume either way, couldn't you? But anyway, you've got uh, a digital coax, i.e. SPDIF input and output. You've got optical in and outputs, which is what I've been using for the most part, and I think everything you're going to hear in this episode is from optical. And then way deep down in there, we've got a sensor switch, which needs to be on if you want to use the remote. And then we've got a pair of ESI ports for the aforementioned timer stuff. And I have no means of testing this. And lastly, the great mystery of this machine, this random phono plug just sticking out the back alongside the power cord. And I can't seem to trace it without removing the entire tape transport from the machine. And I actually emailed Rolf at the DCC Museum about this, and he thought it was some sort of aftermarket mod, but he didn't know the significance of it either. Anyway, let's do that demo thing, and let's kick things off with an A-B comparison between a DCC and its period-appropriate CD counterpart. And this was just pure serendipity for me, because not long after I got this machine, I was out thrifting, and I stumbled onto a copy of the parent album of the Vanessa Williams track that was on the included demo tape. And of course, the CD still has the thrift store tag on it. So anyway, what you're going to hear here is an A-B comparison of a theoretically perfect dub of the DCC tape uh, via optical uh, stacked up against a wave rip of the same song from the CD. Sometimes the snow comes down in June Sometimes the very thing you're looking for Some silly girl had set you free You wondered how
changed the world. I changed the world. I think for the time, Phillips more or less had the right idea, just not necessarily the right product. Uh, had the DCC caught on, I just don't think it would have lasted more than a few years. And I say that because the mini disc would catch up in quality within a year or two, and things like CD burners and MP3 players were effectively right around the corner. And also, at the same time, cassettes were on their way out, and I just think its days would have been pretty explicitly numbered from the get-go. Now, taken in context of the time, I can't say it's any real shock that the mini-disc wound up winning this little format war, and it wasn't much of a war. Uh, really, they were just more reliable, more robust, the gears held up a lot better, and indeed, I think I still prefer the mini disc. But having said that, I am glad I got to play with the DCC and presumably will play with it again once I get it fixed up some more. But otherwise, that's it for today's archive. Join me next time when I suffer some very, very horrible flashbacks to when I was in college, when I had to put up with the DAT format. I can't deny it I thought of quitting but my heart just won't bite